I did a, some more digging around and researching and trying to find out about that uh, series of sermons I shared with y'all last week from David Jeremiah. And so far, he has not, at least on his website or, uh, or any of his other outlets, he hasn't even mentioned it or said anything about it. But a couple of other places that I found, they're all in agreement that that is not him, that it is definitely either somebody just, just taking a bunch of his sermons and piecing them together, and probably AI, uh, artificial intelligence, that did it. So uh, I agree, because Dr. Jeremiah wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't do that, just, just wouldn't do that. So I agree with that, that I think that's pretty much what it is. We're going to be in Mark 13 again today, kind of following up or, or bringing the end of uh, the message from last week. And uh, I just want to uh, encourage you that stuff like that's going to happen more and more. Yes, and and uh, not only because we're in the end times, but because of artificial intelligence and the way things are going with that. And just because people like to fool with other people, people like to do stuff like that. It's kind of like vandalism. You know, there's actually, there's no purpose in vandalism. Nobody actually gains anything. They just tear something up or, or damage something just to do it. And that, that that's kind of what's happening there. And it's going to happen more and more. And so I want to encourage you that when you see something, especially if it's on me, <laughs> If you see something against somebody or a preacher, a church, a denomination, research it before you make a, a, a judgment and, and, and find out everything you can before you spread it or, or, or do something like that because we can do just as much damage mm -hmm. by furthering false information than we can by standing up and finding out what's right. So Mark chapter 13, as I said, we're going to finish up uh, what we started last week, and I'm pretty sure I'll finish it up this week. So uh, uh, I, I went back over a lot of it during the week and edited even some of it out. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the last days. We're going to talk about Jesus' message here as we uh, look at what he presented to the disciples and between Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21. I'm going to be going back and forth between those two uh, a couple of times. And the title of the message is, well, what will you be doing when Jesus comes for you? And that's where we're going to wind up. But to start with, last week we talked about the false prophets. We talked about all the things that's going to happen in the end time. And what I want to focus on here to begin with is how not to be deceived in the end times. How not to be deceived today. Because there's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of false teaching. A lot of false churches out there. One of these days I, I want to take maybe a Wednesday night and just share with you some of the emails I get. And uh, some of the things that people, uh, in particular when I teach on... Uh, uh, prophecy and end time things. Some of the uh, uh, did y'all know that Megatron is an archangel? I didn't mean to. That that tripped me out. But but he's an archangel and, and he can only go into the Holy of Holies once a year. I'm thinking Megatron is off of the Transformers. You know, so somebody's getting their theology and their and their theater. <coughs> mixed up a little bit here, but that's, that's the kind of stuff I get, and people are talking to these angels and, you know, things like that, so how not to be deceived in the last days? Many have thought, a lot of Christians think, well, I'm, I'm not really worried about it, okay, I'm a Christian, and so I know that God's going to protect me, I know I'm going to heaven. I know that all of this stuff in the end time is going to work out. So, you know, it's, it's just going to work out the way it does. So I'm not going to worry about it. And I would adopt that attitude also if about a third of the Bible weren't in the Bible. But since Jesus put all of this stuff in the scripture, and I'm going to worry about it a little bit. I'm going to be concerned about it. Remember what I told you last week when we were talking about this to set it up. This 
teaching that Jesus is giving his disciples is the last true set down I'm going to teach you that he did before he was crucified. And again, folks, it, it wasn't what we would expect it to be. It was on the prophecy. It was on the end time. And yes, if you're a born again child of God, you're going to heaven. Yes, if you're a born again child of God, the Holy Spirit is going to protect you. First John talks about it like this. If you remember the old King James, it's, we have an unction from the Holy One. We have an anointing. We have the indwelling, the filling of the Holy Spirit. And yes, he's going to protect us. But folks, there is something to us. You and me can possibly and probably will fall to some level of deception in the end time. If there weren't something to it, Jesus wouldn't have said all of this. And especially when you read some of these, in particular, uh, verse 20, if the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he cut those days short for the sake of the elect. And then keep going. And he says in verse 21, then if anyone tells you, see, here's the Messiah, see there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. So do you see, the first thing that upsets me about that verse is all of that deception, lying signs and wonders, false apostles, is in the same verse as the word elect. That's the first thing that bothers me about it. And if there was no chance that I couldn't be deceived or I couldn't fall for, for some false teaching to some level, some degree, why would he even say that? Why, why would he even bring it up? And when you read this whole passage, uh, uh, beginning uh, verse 5, uh, Christian standard now, verse 5, watch out that no one deceives you. Verse 6, and that will they will deceive many. Verse 7, don't be alarmed. Verse 9, be on your guard. Here we go. Verse um, 21, and they will, they will uh, lead astray, if possible, the elect. 23, and you must watch. I have told you everything in advance. And then you get down into 32 through 37, which is where we're going. One, two, three, four times he says, be alert, be alert. One time he says, watch. And one time he says, don't get caught sleeping. So if there weren't something to it, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have done all this. If it was just a simple fact that, look, church, just go on about your business, do what you're doing, and, and when it's time, I'll come rapture you out of here and we'll be gone. Half of this is unnecessary. But folks, it's all there. And then when you go read Paul's writings, the things he warned us about, when you go read John's writings in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and I mean, man, he hammers on it. And then Peter. And the thing, go to 2nd Peter chapter 3 real quick. Go to 2nd Peter chapter 3. Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder so that you recall the words previously spoken by the prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Above all, y'all see that? In, in verse 3, it may not say above all in your translation, but it's going to say something along those lines. Above all, what? Be aware of scoffers who will come in the last days scoffing and following their own evil desires and saying, where is his coming that he promised? Did you know that right now in theology circles and church circles today, those that teach, and basically we're dispensationalists. I'm not a, a strict dispensationalist, but I am a dispensationalist. 
and we teach the premillennial, pre-tribulational rapture. And did you know we're in the minority and we are belittled more and more for our, our belief? And what is, it, it, they're scoffing because they're saying it's not coming, it's not gonna happen. The, all of that prophecy, it's over and done. Scoffers. Goes on and, and he, just, he just hammers, you know, here's what's gonna happen, here's what's gonna happen. Get down to verse 17. This, this is where I want you to see in 2 Peter chapter three. In verse 17, he tells us what he's really concerned about. <coughs> And you'll notice that it is not the scoffers and the false prophets that he's really concerned about. What's he concerned about? You and me. That we fall from our secure position. He said, therefore, dear friends, since you know this in advance, be on your guard so that you are not led away by the error of lawless people and fall from your own stable position. So who's he worried about? He's not worried about the false prophets. They're coming. Nothing we can do about it. He's not worried about the scoffers. He's just letting us know what they're going to do, what's going to happen. What's he worried about? He's worried about you and me, that we will get caught up in false teachers and we'll get caught up in the, the scoffers and the things that are going on in the last days. And you say, well, preacher, it's not going to happen to me. Well, it might. That's what Jesus is warning us about. And when we get down to 32 through 37, and, and that's where we're going, you're going to see that Jesus is not really worried about the false prophets either. It, it, I'm going to show you something that's a little bit of a twist in the way that, that we normally get hammered with this passage, okay? So how do we not be deceived? In these days. Now I want to give you two things from Mark chapter 13 here about how not to be deceived in these last days. And number one is study your Bible. It's that simple. Study your Bible. Notice what he says in, in verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The only sure foundation in this world is the word of God. The only thing in this world that will never fail is the truth that God has laid out and given us. When all else around me, and I love that old song, is sinking sand. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. How do we not be deceived? We study our Bibles. We know the truth. Do you know one of the reasons when God called me to preach... I, I you always hear preachers telling the story, you know, I, I ran from God. I didn't want to preach, you know, and I was fighting it. When God called me to preach, my biggest question was, is it me calling me to preach or God calling me to preach? Because I wanted to preach. I wanted to, to be in the ministry and to serve the Lord. And one of the reasons that my ministry, since I started preaching, has focused on the Word of God and on you've got to read the Bible, you've got to study God's Word, is because of Christians, not lost people. It's because of the ignorance, and I mean that in the true sense of the word, that we have of Scripture. And sometimes... That some of the things that we claim we believe and we say that the Bible says and it just doesn't do it. It's it just not there. If you want to protect yourself, if you want to make sure that you are not deceived, not only in the last days, but today, you've got to study your Bible. You've got to meditate upon the word of God. In places, Peter puts it like that it should be like food to you. It should be, have, none of you would go a day without eating unless you just had to, unless the doctor had you, your mouth sewed up and, and, and you couldn't force it through your nose. <laughs> Amen? Amen? But yet, how many of you have gone, let's just say last week, at least two days without even picking up the Bible? How about three or four? Anybody want to be real and honest? 
But that's how we nourish our spirit. That's how we grow in our spiritual strength and our knowledge of the Lord. And, and if we don't pick up the word of God and read it and meditate on it, how are you going to do things like test the spirits? How are you going to do things like discern the truth of the preacher? How are you going to know if I'm telling you the truth? Huh? Well, Brother Don, you're our pastor. I don't care. The Bible says that demons masquerade as ministers of righteousness. So how are you going to know if you don't study the Bible? And when Jesus says that the deception in the last days is going to be so great that if it were possible, even the elect, those that are saved, would be deceived, how do you think you're going to stand? John says in 1 John chapter 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus says twice in this passage, John, Mark chapter 13, he says twice that there will be false apostles, false prophets, and false messiahs that go out into the world. And notice, if you would, in, in verse 22, he says, For false messiahs and false prophets will arise, and watch this, and will perform signs and wonders. Now as hungry as we are today for spiritual truth. And spiritual reality. If somebody comes through here. And performs signs and wonders. And we can't debunk him. Like a lot of the guys on TV right now. Folks he, he going to get a bunch of us. If he can come through in Jesus name. And do a few things. He going to get a bunch of us. Because that is what we're looking for. Jesus warns us over and over. But you know what else Jesus tells us? He says, you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. The other side of that is if you don't know the truth, then you're susceptible not only to being deceived, but you're susceptible to the bondage of, of fear and confusion and to false prophets. So, number one, folks, study your Bible. Read your Bible. Meditate. Memorize the Word of God. Get it down inside of you. <coughs> so, when you are faced with error, you will know the truth. Number two, how do we not be deceived in these days? Be alert. Be alert. Look at verse 33. Watch and be, let me just read this passage, beginning in 32. He says, now concerning that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Watch, be alert, for you don't know when the time is coming. It is like a man on a journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants, go each one to his work, and commanded the doorkeeper to be alert. Therefore, be alert. Since you don't know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening or at midnight or at the crowing of the rooster or early in the morning. Otherwise, when he comes suddenly, he might find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to everyone, be alert. Now, just real quick, in that passage, what are we to be alert for? What are we to be looking for? Is it false prophets? Is it false messiahs? No, what are we to be looking for? Jesus, the master to come back. So when you hear somebody like me and a couple of others preaching and saying you should walk around with one eye up and one eye, look, at that's the truth. And, and Paul in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, don't, don't be looking at stuff down here. Keep your heart and your mind on things above. If I've got my eye, if my heart, my spirit is looking and I'm waiting and I'm wanting Jesus to come back, I'm going to have a whole lot easier time down here. Amen? Yes, sir. That's what scripture says. We say different. It's, it's the old saying, and I've heard this all my life, and you have too. He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Well, folks, that is 
total opposite of what the Bible says. Yes, sir. Totally opposite. We should be so heavenly minded that we will be some earthly good. And that's what he's telling them. He's saying, look, you don't know when I'm coming back. Not the false apostles. He's just like Peter. He's not really that concerned. He's just giving us information with all these false apostles and, and signs and wonders and wars and rumors of wars. He's just giving us information. What he wants us to understand is that he's coming back. And we need to be alert. We need to be watching. We need to be ready. Luke chapter 21 verse 28. Mark it down or jot it down or, or turn over there real quick and mark it so you can get this. Luke 21 verse 28. But when all of these things begin to happen, all the signs and wonders, all the false prophets, all the wars, all the famines, all the plagues. But when all of these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh. Mm -hmm. You know, and I could preach another side of this too. How do we go through all this mess without being afraid or being worried? Don't look at it. Look up. Don't, don't be wondering what's going on over there or over there. Look up. Know that when all of this stuff starts, Jesus is coming. And am I to be concerned about what's going to happen to me in this world? No, he, he covers that back up here, back in, in Mark 13, beginning in verse 9 and going down through about verse 13. I'm not to be concerned about what's going to happen to me. Well, what if I get, what if I get bird flu or what if I get pig swine or, or, or all that kind of stuff? Well, what if you do? What if you don't? Chances are if you live long enough, you're going to get cancer in some form anyway. Or have heart disease. So what does it matter if it comes from getting old or if it comes from, from China? What, what does it matter? Well, I might starve to death. Well, you might starve to death anyway. Well, I, I might get blowed up in an atomic bomb or, or I might get caught in a crossfire between well, drug cartels and, and, and detect. Yeah, and you might get killed going to town this afternoon. So what are you looking for? Jesus. Jesus. That's his whole point. Be alert. Why? I'm coming back. And you don't know when. You have got to be ready. When all of these other things begin to happen, rather than scare us, rather than upset us, rather than to cause us to doubt some part of the word of God because something didn't just happen the way we thought it should or become some false prophet. Uh, I, I saw a guy the other day and we conversed a little bit. Uh, he said Ezekiel chapter 37, the prophecy of the dry bones. And then in, and from there he goes right into the, the stick prophecy. Remember we talked about that Wednesday night where he tells uh, Ezekiel, he says, take two sticks Right on one for Israel, right on the other for Judah. And then he says, put them together and make one stick because he said, I'm going to regather them and I'm going to make one nation out of them like they were supposed to be. And this guy, he has proved that what that prophecy means is that Israel cannot sign a treaty to give the Gaza Strip to the Palestinians. That's what I said. I said, what? How? That, that doesn't, it's, doesn't even say anything about that. And the sad thing about it is it is one of those prophecies in Scripture that there's no symbolism. There, there's no apocalyptic language. He tells you exactly what he means, exactly what's going to happen and exactly how it's going to work out. And this guy took it and he's making it apply to what's happening in the Middle East today. How many people do you think had already viewed that and given him thumbs up? I've only got 717 subscribers and I average 10 or 12 thumbs up per message. This guy's got 30,000 subscribers 
And already on that one message, he had 127 thumbs up. My point is, it could just as easily be you if you don't know the truth. If you're not in the word of God, if you don't know what the Bible says, if you don't go to a church where they teach and preach the word of God, it could just as easily be you. It could just as easily be me. I could have seen that video of David Jeremiah. I could have flipped over there and listened to it. And I could have said, oh my gosh, the rapture's going to happen in 2024. Ran out and sold everything I've got. Wrapped the sheet around me, climbed a tree and waited. <laughs> and you know what? They did that two or three times. Two or three times people have done that. Why didn't I? I know the truth. I know the truth. It amazes me that one of the things that he warns him about is that there's going to be false messiahs. There are going to be people rise up and say, I am the messiah. I am the Christ. And people are going to fall for it. That's what 1 John says. That they, they're going to fall for that spirit of antichrist when Jesus plainly says in it, at least one Acts, Revelation 1, and then Isaiah. At least four times the scripture says that at the second coming, who will see him? Every eye will see him. He says that the second coming is going to be like lightning that flashes from one end of the heaven to the other end of the heaven. And nobody is going to stop and say, what just happened? Because they're going to know. But yet when all of these false messiahs come, people are going to flock to them by the thousands. Jesus says that we are to do two things. We are to be alert and we are to be about the business that the master left us to do. Whatever it is, what, what's your gift? What is God using you for? What has God called you to do? That's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be preaching and teaching the word of God. What are you supposed to be doing? So my original question then, what will you be doing when Jesus comes? Will you be serving the Lord? Will you be doing what you're supposed to be doing? Or will you be hung up with some false preacher, false teacher? Or will you be one of those that, you know, I could really care less. It's all going to pan out in the end. I hate to be one of them when I stand before Jesus. And the Lord says, what'd you do with my word? Well, Lord, I really didn't do anything because I just knew it'd pan out in the end. How do you think he's going to react to that? Especially when he says, study to show yourself approved. A workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. And that brings me to my last point. What will you be doing? When Jesus comes back for you, will you be serving the Lord? Will you be holy and righteous and pure before him? Or will you be caught up in the world? Will you be doing things you shouldn't be doing? Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. First John 2, 28. Everybody there? So now, little children, remain in him so when he appears, when? What, what, what's the time frame of this verse? When he appears, when he calls us home. So for you and me, be the rapture. So when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So when Jesus comes, what will you be doing? And 
when you hear that trumpet sound or when your eyes close in death and the next face that you see is Jesus. Well, according to this verse, one of two things are going to happen. You're going to have confidence before him or you're going to be ashamed. Turn, if you would, to 2 John. Look at verse 8. I've had people tell me that this wasn't in their Bible. <laughs> Second John verse 8. What does he say? Watch yourselves so that you don't lose what we have worked for, but that you may receive a full reward. What will you be doing when Jesus comes? You remember... 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, when we stand before the judgment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. When we stand before the beam of seat of Christ, our works are going to be judged. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. And remember what he says. It's kind of a funny picture, but it actually, it's, it's sad. He said, he said, some are going to receive reward, but some are going to lose everything, and they're going to be saved as though by fire. Yes, they'll be saved, but they won't have a thing. And he says they will suffer loss. Now, you and I as Christians, we've been taught all our lives that when we get to heaven, everything's going to be fair, everything's going to be even. You know, there's not going to be any, any tears, you know, anything like that. And there's not going to be, but you've got to put that in its proper location, time-wise. That's not going to happen until after the great white throne and we enter into eternity. That's when Jesus clocks that. There are at least two passages that tell us that when we get to heaven, one of two things are going to happen. For Christians, because lost people aren't going to be there, one of two things are going to happen. We're going to have confidence we're going to be overjoyed. We're going to be given an abundant entrance into heaven. Or we're going to be ashamed. And we're going to lose our reward. And again, some of you are probably thinking right now, I know a lot of people are. Yeah, but I'll be in heaven. Well, yeah, you will. I, you will. I'm going to give you that. But what you going to do with the rest of the Bible? What you going to do with all of this stuff that Jesus said and told us? So, what will you be doing when Jesus comes? Will I be weeping, wailing, shouting hallelujah, getting up, falling down, Tell me where will I be when he comes. Amen. Amen. Let's stand.